Uh, two things before we actually kick it to the panel. One is, there were like four minutes more left for the match. So someone should say finally what is the outcome. I can see a lot of you actually watching the match on the screen. And that's, that's somewhere relates back to the topic of the uh, discussion, uh, which is the mobile screen. And uh, second is uh, quite good that we are following up, following through after the technology panel as a marketing panel because we, uh, means just, just to set a context when you look at it, uh, means there are around 650 billion odd mobile uh, smartphones in the country. And uh, if you just leave the less than 10, uh, 10 year old kids, almost every Indian has a mobile phone not more than a meter away for almost 24 hours. So that's the kind of scale we are talking about of a device which is there in your life and for so much time. Including now when we, are, we were uh, listening to the panel, we are also watching the FIFA match. And I guess Argentina didn't get through with this match. So if, if that is the kind of an impact, obviously marketers will also follow. Marketers will also follow where the consumers are, so they are doing it. But uh, what is happening is uh, the user journey or the consumer journey on this platform has become very, very complex, and uh, which is making their life quite miserable. And actually, marketers are asking more and more that how to actually demystify it, how to actually see the impact of it. Does it work? Does it not work? And that brings back brings to our topic that what metrics matter actually. So. That's broadly the context, and if I can just pick up from the last conversation only, metaverse, then there is top funnel, conversion, commerce, then there is, uh, I'm actually losing platforms, social, chatting, video, so much is happening. There's too much pressure on that one small screen, if you realize. And uh, it's becoming uh, quite difficult. So. It almost sounds like chaos. Is it actually chaos or there is method to this madness? Uh, you want to take this actually? Uh, sure, Gish. Yeah, I think there are very few people here, so I guess we're going to just chat amongst ourselves yeah. primarily. But we just super. want people to come closer. But yeah, but but clearly, you come there or you guys can yeah, come you guys can come here and we can have like a great conversation. But yeah, so obviously there's, there's a lot of chaos as you say, but I think very exciting times. And as marketers, I think we should be, uh, you know, we should prioritize marketing first, not try to become data scientists because the moment we get into too much of data, we lose focus of the big picture, right? Uh, which is trying to figure out what our objectives are. And the objectives haven't changed over the, you know, over the years. So even when there was television, there's television advertising, print advertising, there's certain objectives of each campaign. So while there is a lot of madness out there, but I think we got to go one level higher and see it from a very broad perspective of bird's eye view in terms of what can one achieve. And clearly, th these are very exciting times right now because digital can do so much uh, than whatever. I think I'm just waiting for the Yeah, bells. the bells sound very well. Yeah. 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 Better. So, uh, so there is a uh, very exciting times ahead, as I mentioned to you, because as marketers now, you can achieve so much from digital. And it's no wonder that digital adx is 56% of the world. It's uh, either over, already overtaken or about to overtake television in the country, right? And I think the advantage of digital is you can do everything possible. You can do mass bombarding, right? So you want to create awareness, you create awareness, and then obviously look at matrix that help you create awareness. You can do limited bombarding, so you create a cohort, take the Deepak's data of home loan customers, and you know other often uh, customers see the crystal data and then target them. You can do surgical strikes and then you can do micro surgical strikes, right? So you can do everything possible with digital. And the idea is you have to figure out what is the objective of your, you know, what do you want to do? What do you what do you want to achieve out of that? So if there's an objective of awareness, then you look at certain metrics. And I've heard of people saying that you know on YouTube my CPC was 19 paise, it did very well. And my first question was on what cohort? Right? Because you that's know, what matters. Digital offers you a cohort, right? A filtration. Girish, right? because you mentioned that point, I have to say that this is a very standard uh, thing comes up. My CPC is X19, 
and it is above the industry benchmark. Yeah, absolutely. I really don't know what the and industry benchmark is. And what the hell does that mean? Because what is an industry benchmark if you don't identify your target group? If your target group, for example, is really, really mass, you're just, you know, doing geo-targeting, you're doing just male, 25 to 35, then, you know, 90 paise could be cheap or could work. I think it's still uh, expensive. But if your cohort is very, very niche, you're talking of people who are following The Economist or, follow, you know, who have iOS on their phone, et cetera, et cetera, then CPCB of 19 paise would, would be, like, amazing, right? So matrix have to be just seen as a trend. They can't be gospel through. Gospel through should be that you look at data, but finally look at what you want to achieve and then take it forward. So there's madness, all right, but as marketeers, it still boils down to that one simple, as we all say, the common sense. Have common sense, focus on what you want to achieve. Digital is right there helping you achieve whatever you want. It's like a magical, you know, bond that you have on a hand. I think the bell keeps ringing. Kirish, that bell was for, for you. <laughs> yeah. Maybe for me to stop, perhaps. Okay, but uh, we have a magical wand in our hand. I yeah. think we should use it to the best of our advantage. Not get bogged down with too much data. Use it to your advantage and make, uh, you know, magic out of it. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, that's there. I mean, and honestly, chaos is good. There's no problem if it's chaos because after chaos, obviously, there comes clarity. So there's no problem. So that, what's your point of view on this one? No, I, I agree with everything I mean, you're saying. So one, chaos is good. Chaos is what allows you to differentiate. If you're, if you're doing something different, then you have an advantage in a chaotic environment. And that happens at the, mic, at the very micro level, the you know, personalization level, where you're bringing a differentiated brand experience onto mobile and therefore causing some stickiness with the customer. But it is happening at a, at a very aggregate level. I mean, to play devil's advocate, this whole uh, India e-commerce mobile smartphone penetration is growing has been on for more than a decade, right? All the projections of Deloitte, BCG, Bain, McKinsey, etc., of how fast it will grow and where India will get to, we've fallen, I mean, let's admit we've fallen behind those growth trends or expectations. So the projections or the optimism that is there has not panned out yet. Now that leaves a lot of room for opportunity. That leaves a lot of room for opportunity ultimately for large organizations to consolidate. The war has not ended over here. It is actually, this is the battleground for the, the world. And we've seen that happening from... Uh, the stage at which innovation has happened, let's say, with a player like Jabong, who then get acquired by a Mintra. Then a Mintra gets acquired by a Flipkart. And then a Flipkart gets acquired by uh, Walmart, right? And ultimately, the game is going to be in those large two or three players. If you're innovative enough, you get a sufficient degree of valuation, which allows you to be acquired and the initial guys to exit. Or you're differentiated enough with sufficient cash flows, which very few organizations across the world are, to win that battleground uh, in the end. I mean, that, that's, that's where the chaos will ultimately settle down. Uh, so we need to be aware of, of what our roles are in, in that larger in fact, chaotic environment. In fact, you just defined the method in that chaos already by saying how consolidation will be one of the, one of the clearly emerging uh, method in the absolute madness that we are seeing. And consolidation of matrix also maybe because there's too much data. There's too much of data flowing. Actually, we often say that digital, we don't understand what works, but it's very contrary because the amount of information that comes out, uh, signals that come up, comes back to uh, agency or to the marketer is not funny. It's a, it's a data overload. The information overload, I often use a phrase which is called uh, the data dump that is coming in is actually making us data dump. So, and uh, because you really don't know to do anything. So, with that data. So, what comes in is that, is there a way to simplify it as simple? Can there be like, uh, you can say three things to look at it, or if I'm oversimplifying it, then make it a bit more complicated, because I know there's too much of data. But something uh, simplifying that with all this information coming in, if you have to step back, what do you, how can we help marketers to do that? And maybe first, you're the master or champion of all the data that is there. So. I like the context setting out here where you guys have created the chaos and told me that, listen, just... Now clear the chaos. Now, now clear the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I, I think we are living in times where if, if I were to just, you know, probably just dumb this down and probably say that, I think we all, when we look at from whatever roles we play today, uh, we are curious enough and we are asking ourselves a lot of questions. Uh, you know, right from simple thing like, okay, did my you know, ad which I played on video, did it generate enough recall? You know, did my ad go to, you know, whatever campaign I ran or whatever, you know, creative I ran, you know, was there 
the right kind of awareness for my brand? Did it create any lift for consideration? So these are points which are always uh, an interest point for all of us uh, in the practice in which you know we pursue today. Yeah, uh, and all these now. So that that's one. So curiosity for us is increasing. Okay. On the other side, technology companies. When you call technology companies, when you call platforms, what we are trying to do is that try to answer that simple question. You know, try to bring in technology, data, right measurement, and try to just answer those questions and hopefully, you know, answer it with a higher degree of accuracy. Okay. So that is where the importance of data comes in. Okay. So I think, you know, if you probably set out an objective, and I'll probably use some examples out here. Okay. Um, like when a brand would say that, look, you know, I looking at driving sales. Okay. I, I want to do performance marketing. I want to generate people who are coming onto my site and purchasing my things. And obviously there are couple of ways in which you could possibly navigate that journey. You could probably say, look, you know what, I've outsourced this to my partner or I'm doing it internally and I'm going to run performance marketing campaigns on Facebook and search. And in that process, when you decide the channel, then you look at the key data points or the key matrices which matter to you. You know, you closely look at very simple funnels. You will say, okay, let me look at my click to lead ratio. Let me look at lead to quality quote. Okay, and if I am in the business of selling used cars, then I am further looking at quality code to inspection ratio as a business. Okay, so that's really one way of defining the journey. And at that point of time, you are consciously muting all the vanity metrics. You want to avoid what is the impression cost out there or what is the CPM out there, what is the, the click-through ratio out there. Those are not priority data points for you you know, when you're going down that path. So I think one part is that we constantly have to ask ourselves that information and data will be available with us. How can we just simplify it, prioritize what matters to us, and try to address that part. Another example I'd like to talk about is, um, and we've done this at Visa, where we basically bring alternate data to marketers. And we basically had a use case where a fintech company, which is basically selling cards, you know, and we came up with a strategy with them that, look, we'll pick up alternate data from our platform, and we'll first expose those 10 million customers from our platform on YouTube. And we'll run an FCAP of one or two on that. So that campaign was executed on YouTube first. Then that same, from that same funnel, there were people who visited the website. And what we also did was we aided the YouTube campaign by targeting the same 10 million users by putting, by deploying our 10 million customers on Facebook, you know, and then nudge them for a sale. So the consumer was nudged at that point of time again. And we saw almost like a 5x lift on the conversion funnel. So what people who finally, you know, had filled up leads, so the lead to the application ratio jumped by almost 5x for us. And there in, so when we put all of this together, and whilst we were working with the brand, it started getting established with the brand that like it's important to do a full funnel campaign where you're integrating, say, a video campaign. Along with that, you're running a performance campaign in a very cohesive manner. So in that scenario, again, you know, it was a learning out there where the brand was only doing performance marketing, performance marketing, but not really executing something cohesively on two platforms. Yeah. So, so I think there again, now someone would say that what is the data which matters to me, right? Okay, so you really will have to look at saying that, look, fine, I get the right customers. I target the right customers from a platform. And then I'm following through, following through the funnel to see what is the the business impact I get, you know, whether it is people where I can directly see the conversion, whether I look at assisted conversions uh, from my campaign. So I think we are all blessed in an environment where we have to cut the noise and focus on key data sets. I want to add to that because uh, very interestingly, uh, Deepak mentioned about performance marketing. And again, performance marketing is typical, right? We do a lot of e-commerce advertising. E-commerce is 100% performance because you're in market, you're doing a search campaign, you're obviously throwing your impressions. If somebody's typed in the word air conditioner, you're obviously bidding for that word, keyword, which is air conditioner, there'll be impressions served. 
there will be a CPC bid, finally the CPC will convert to a CTR, that CTR will convert to a product page view, the product page view has to convert. It's a long cycle that you measure. And obviously in a performance marketing campaign, you'll imagine that, you know, what is your investment, what conversions had happened, and what is your ROAS, as they call it, right? Return on your advertising spend. We'd see it like that as a marketer and say, okay, this campaign worked or not. But very interestingly, we should also see one more thing, right? Because when you're going on Amazon or on Flipkart and searching for air conditioner, you may have seen my sponsored listing. You may not have clicked on it, right? You've gone ahead and done that. Your entire performance marketing you know, funnel doesn't measure that impression that I served onto you. You saw a Blue Star air conditioner, for example, my sponsored listing. You didn't click on it. My entire funnel didn't capture it at all. But so many million impressions got served at no cost for me. So many people saw it, only when you clicked is when I paid. But when you didn't click it, it didn't get paid, right? So that's one more thing you got to consider beyond the funnel because, you know, these are impressions served. You have created equity. Everything will not get converted there and then. You know, they take a 14-day attribution. Somebody takes a 30-day attribution, things like that. But always also treat performance marketing, and I've heard this uh, quite often saying performance marketing does not go with brand building and brand awareness. Actually, they do because you're creating impressions in your consumers actually searching. Uh, for a particular product or a service. And again, you know, again, within pr performance marketing, you have branded keywords, you have generic keywords, and you have competitive keywords. And again, you know, it's very easy because if somebody's searching for a Blue Star air conditioner and I'm doing a sponsored listing there, obviously my performance matrix will be great. And then the agency will say, wow, you've done a super job. We've done a superb job that, you know, see your ROAS and see your ACOS. It's gone down. But finally, the proof of the bidding uh, pudding would be in the competitive mapping, right? When somebody is just typing a generic keyword or a competitive keyword like an LG AC or a Voltas AC for me, and then me getting that, you know, customer to click and that customer eventually buying, that is the proof of the pudding. So we've got to look at it all holistically. It's not like white or black. It's all gray out there. And like I said before, let's not put a data lens to it. Let's not become data scientists. Let's look at marketing, uh, you know, in the true sense of the word. You know, for, for this group, uh, I must tell you, we were uh, there in another room waiting and watching the football match uh, there while we were waiting to come on the stage and we were cracking a joke about how the, f the first kick or the first click was amazing. After that, the assist actually failed and the final conversion completely leakage bottom funnel. There was a one goal which was happening and they made a mess out of it. So, so we were joking about that. So yeah, it's almost, vi visualize it like a football. If that assist is not there right, if the right person is not there at the right place, it will never going to convert. And that's basically the summary of the long discussion we had. Watch football. <laughs> so, yeah, which is, okay. Uh, moving from there, actually, this is, uh, Siddharth, absolutely down your alley, I wanted to ask you, because you're working in one of the most complex uh, uh, marketing ecosystem when it comes to digital marketing itself. They, you have like demand, uh, demand creation in a different platform, demand conversion on, a, uh, on PCs and laptops uh, versus crea uh, creation will happen mostly on mobile, the browsing and all. Then obviously the super complex business structure also that we were talking about it. So uh, when it comes to heart matrix, business, brand matrix and all, are we seeing mobile screen actually standing up because we are expecting a very small screen to make a very huge impact? Are you seeing that? It, it, you are, it depends on how you want to look at the data and what, I mean, what metric is ultimately that you're focusing on, right? If you look at, um, look at it with a longer five, 10 year horizon and you see what is the digital spend I'm doing, do I want to spend on, say, performance marketing for something as simple as Delhi Bangalore flights? Or do I let the aggregator, who is also not going to get a return on that investment, but will drive his valuation by user acquisition, right? So it's what the telecom companies have gone through over a period of time, right? Your ARPU or your acquisition and number of users is what is driving the valuation. It's not profitable. If somebody else is willing to invest money to grow the market for me and bring in more consumers, they're more than welcome to do that, right? Unless it's at the cost of a long-term stickiness to that aggregator or platform. And by aggregator, I include the Googles and, uh, you know, the intermediaries of the world right from the thought that occurs in the consumer's mind to the actual booking. 
if you look at the initial months just after the first wave of the pandemic, purely because of cash flows, our entire industry stopped spending, right? There were no flights being booked, so we stopped spending. Uh, which meant we stopped spending on performance marketing and digital advertising, consolidated across all of us. Nothing changed in share of search or market share, right? Uh, when one player starts spending, everybody has to spend to stay alive. But if you step back from that, you realize actually there is no value being added by Google outside of the core value of organic search. Beyond that, yes, they will say, okay, fine, now I have search results. Now you pay me to display your ad higher, and then I'll get somebody else to pay to display their bid higher. So ultimately, what just, really matters, yeah, is you just is, created a bid explosion. You just created you created something in the middle, which is yeah. Sucking money away from the ecosystem, from the consumer as well as from the brand, right? Yeah. Which in the long term you don't need. What you do need, therefore, is, is a stickiness uh, with the experience that you're able to provide. Because as a brand, you stand for some experience. You stand for some product uh, or some service quality that you want to be able to translate, which is not there in the mobile screen of today. It's an undifferentiated booking journey. If you actually want to stand for something, create a differentiated booking and search experience which is a transference of what you want to deliver as a brand. Uh, and that's your pure metric. What is the NPS score, for example, of my loyalty member on my, my mobile app versus the score of the same member when he's booking me through an aggregator? This is, some fa this is one of the most fabulous and real life example you can actually get to because uh, in such candidness, nobody will talk about you what it does in short term and long term. So thanks for sharing this, Dad. That's a very powerful one. Moving on, I can see the time ticker has been suddenly reduced, I guess. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, I will try to speed it up and close on this one. One of the important point is when we talk about this entire mobile marketing ecosystem, so much of muscle memory that we have built over a period of time, uh, we know it's getting a bit disrupted now with a lot of policy changes, whether it's by platforms like Android, Apple, or by government policies coming in. And it's going to change a lot of things around. And uh, marketers are likely to lose their edge uh, in how they actually market uh, in future. For all the sexy things on uh, technology, it can actually impact a lot. So maybe Deepak, you can actually uh, touch upon it a bit in terms of how they actually maintain their edge. What is something they need to do now that they are compliant at the same time, they don't lose the edge. See, I think, um, you know, every time when we speak about any change, uh, you, know, in, you know, and when we go through some big shifts in the market, it presents a new opportunity. You know, so uh, I think the opportunity is massive there. Obviously, you know, when you're talking about it, you're talking about uh, a future world which is uh, a privacy-first ecosystem and a privacy-first ecosystem which enables you to do uh, responsible digital marketing to your consumers you know that's really by and large what we are looking at and when you talk about any global platform or any particular platform uh, whether it is a global platform or a local platform I think at, at, at the first level uh, the platform and the consumer the relationship which exists between a consumer and a platform needs to be respected and that really that respect will start off with a fairly explicit consent of how the consumer's data is leveraged by the platform. Okay, like for example, you know, if I were to just, uh, and, and there is a bit of consumer awareness which is needed, if we were to like probably ask anyone on this room, and if I can probably ask people on the same panel itself, that how many people would have cared to read the privacy policy on Amazon when you go and shop? Has anyone read the privacy policy of Amazon when you go and shop on Amazon? None of us or maybe one of us, right? So now you're basically saying that, so what does the privacy policy of Amazon really say, you know, when you go and shop on that platform? Yeah, so it really calls out that, look guys, uh, uh, as you spend time on the platform, uh, we are organizing, you know, customers in an anonymized manner and we are creating a cluster called interest-based ads. Okay, now they go ahead and define that that what is interest-based ads. Uh, and they also mentioned that on the platform, that look, we will do collaboration and partnerships with marketing technology companies, where we will share with them anonymized profiles of customers. We would not share your PII information. We would not share your number, name, anything, 
It is just interest-based cohorts which are anonymized. Uh, and that is, those interest-based cohorts will be leveraged by them and the marketing technology partner to serve you with ads, not just on Amazon, but off Amazon as well. Now, this is what is mentioned there, okay? Now, similarly, practically any other platform will have their own privacy policy or terms of service and they would call this out, okay? So, I was coming to the point that one, yes, the platform is engaging with the consumer and, and calling it out. On the other hand, the consumer, instead of complaining, should make the effort to go ahead and consume that policy. Uh, as an ecosystem, as an industry, as a responsible industry, we should all, it's like, you know, when Amphi runs a campaign and says, invest in mutual fund, but it is subject to certain risk. Fair enough, and everyone is aware about it. So I think at some level, the industry should come together and probably do a campaign with consumers, and in that case, whether it's government or any other body, which tells people and makes people aware that any platform, whether it is a telecom operator, whether it is a retailer, whether it is a utility platform, read the privacy policy or be aware about it you know yeah. i think in life as people do that that's when the trust yeah. and the consent comes in yeah. and uh, i know that when he's looking at me right now he's saying that deepak time wrap up the question time uh, um, but we will just attribute all of this to the e4m team because yeah, because, uh, because they dragged us she's also watching us very carefully so so there's a timer which is blinking right uh -huh. here and the, suddenly the clock was like ticking very fast, you know, yeah. so 30 minutes and then switch to 5 minutes. Yeah, we start, we were good 40 Otherwise minutes We have a clock it. here which keeps telling us whether we are over and, time, and so it yes. started fine, but the 30 minutes became yeah, yeah. 10 minutes. And, yes. and I will also say that when we walked in, there were only 7 or 8 people in the room. Yeah. So, you know, when we were searching for words, we said, listen, how do we engage with only 7, 8 people in the room? <laughs> but now we have so more as the crowd so started glad, building up, we said we, we are in a reset mode. We are in a reset mode. We got into the vibe of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> On that lovely note, I think let's wrap up because she took another step out into the stage, making sure we just wrap We've up. We've taken over. They can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for listening to us. And uh, uh, on this note, I will say, yeah, one thing on the last question that I asked just to wrap up, the marketing people, how they get the edge, maybe I can close on that note is, there's a lot of, uh, the marketers need to invest a lot in their ecosystem to build infrastructure for their, uh, infrastructure to manage the consumer data. And once, once that uh, infrastructure gets built up and connects back with the platform, they will be much more effective. Some industries are already ahead, and uh, Siddharth, I'm, I'm sure your experience on this, your experience on this obviously will be very, very rich, but there are, huge CPG world and many other ca categories where they have not even taken the steps. And if they don't, they will actually will not be as effective marketers in future. So they need to start now. Yeah, so they need to invest in technology and capabilities. Yeah. Basically partner with people like us on technology yeah. and capabilities. Don't do metaverse, but just manage your consumer data. On that note, thank you. Thank you.